can you shut off Teams? Good to go. Yes, Mr. Chair, we are now live. Good evening and welcome to the June 14 meeting of the Montgomery County Historic Preservation Commission. My name is Bob Sutton. I'm the chair and I would like for commission members and staff to introduce themselves starting on my left. Christina Arado. Jeffrey Haynes. Karen Burdett. Julie Pelletier. Michael Galway. Zara Nasser. Mark Dominiani. John Liebert's Historic Preservation Staff. Rebecca Ballow, Historic Preservation Staff. And Dan Brugert, Historic Preservation Staff. Thank you. Um, I will now, uh, we will now uh, in our agenda go to historic area work permits. Have the work permits been advertised? Yes, Sorry. yes Mr. Chair, they were advertised in the May 31st edition of the Washington Times. Thank you. If anyone is here to testify on any of these cases, or if anyone is here in opposed to any of the cases that we are going to look at <clears throat> for um, uh, on our consent agenda, um, please let the let the um, staff know. So we will start with um, item one. Hang on here. One C at 7423 Carroll Avenue in Tacoma Park, 1F at 26105 Frederick Road, Clarksburg, 1G at 7334 Carroll Avenue, Tacoma Park, 1I at 11200 River View Drive, Potomac, 1J at 4600 Waverly Avenue, 1K at 10 uh, 1,221 Montgomery Avenue, Kensington, I'm sorry, not no, that one, not cross that, that one. one off, sorry. 1L, <clears throat> at uh, 7311 Baltimore Avenue, Tacoma Park. 1M, at 7305 Tacoma Avenue, Tacoma Park. 1N, at 10302 Fawcett Street, Kensington. 1O at 7310 Maple Avenue, Tacoma Park. 1P at 5510 Lambeth Road, Bethesda. And case 1S at 7 Philadelphia Street, Tacoma Park. Mr. Chair, hearing no objections, I move that we approve the following historic area work permits in accordance with the staff reports based upon the record before us and in consideration of the recommendations of the local advisory panels, including conditions recommended by staff. Hop number 1026855 at 7423 Carroll Avenue, Tacoma Park. Hop number 1029753 at 26105 Frederick Road, Clarksburg. Hop number 1029725 at 7334 Carroll Avenue, Tacoma Park. Hop number 1030191 at 11200 Riverview Drive, Potomac. Hop number 130378 at 4600 Waverly Avenue, Garrett Park. Hop number 1030519 at 7311 Baltimore Avenue, Tacoma Park. Hop number 1033753 3, at 7305 Tacoma Park. Hop number 127503 at 10302 Fawcett Street, Kensington. Hop number 10314400 at 7310 Maple Avenue, Tacoma Park. Hop number 1031842 at 5510 Lambeth Road, Bethesda. And hop number 1029926, Philadelphia, Tacoma Park. Is there a second? It's Commissioner Haynes, I'll second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. Thank you for preparing projects that we can easily approve. That makes our lives very easy. 
So now we will move to um, hearing on items <clears throat> on our agenda. And we will start with item number 1A, which is a reconsideration on 12 East um, Melrose Street in Chevy Chase. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Chair. I have a brief presentation on the reconsideration for the hop at 12 East Melrose Street in Chevy Chase Village. Subject property is in front of you. It's a contributing resource to the district. It was constructed circa 1918. Uh, it has a large side yard. Um, this hop is reviewed under Chapter 24A, the Chevy Chase Village Historic District Design Guidelines, and the Secretary of the Interior's Standards for Rehabilitation. So on April 26th of this year, the HPC held a hearing on the proposal because the applicant did not agree with, the, with one of the recommended conditions, or staff recommended conditions. During deliberation, uh, the commissioners suggested they were amenable to the applicant's position, but deferred consideration until the Chevy Chase Village LAP weighed in on the project. Uh, the applicant did agree to uh, paint the four-foot picket fence, which was one of the recommended conditions. So on May 17th, the HPC received comments from the local advisory panel, which supported the project as proposed. Uh, and, and their comments read, there are ma uh, very many solid wood six-foot fences separating properties in the Chevy Chase Village, and most of them extend to the front wall plane. Some have been in place for a while, but some are relatively new. The Chevy Chase Village LAP considers the proposed six-foot fence described in the hop to be compatible and consistent with the fencing used throughout the Chevy Chase Village. Therefore, the Chevy Chase Village LAP recommends the HPC approve the installation of the six-foot fence from the rear uh, of the property forward to the front wall plane. And then at the May 24th, 2023 HPC meeting, the HPC acknowledged receipt of the LAP's comments and moved to approve the HOP uh, with the staff recommendations without any additional findings. So the applicant uh, requests the HPC reconsider its May 26, 2023 decision um, and to discuss the comments provided and del to deliberate on the issue. Uh, and the applicant's here to answer any questions that you may have, and I'll answer any questions at this time as well. Are there any questions for staff? Thank you. Um, I have uh, for this project Brody Barger. And Mr. Chair, if I can jump in real quickly. Uh, the, just just to, to remind uh, the HPC, the issue of fencing that we're con discussing is um, all within this blue box, which is approximately 40 linear feet of fencing. Um, and I think the applicant, applicant's representative is here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. If you could turn on your mic and state your name for the record, that would be terrific. My name is Brody Barger on behalf of Leslie McKay. Thank you. Uh, do you have a presentation or would you just like to answer questions? Uh, I did not realize I was supposed to represent from the uh, 26th that, meeting. In that's April, absolutely so fine. I did not have that prepared. Um, Are there any questions for Mr. Um, Barger? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will, um, without, without further with, uh, deliberation, would anyone like to kick off deliberations on this project? Well, I think I, I can do this. <laughs> um, based on the, um, the recommendation from the LAP, um, I move that we approve the uh, six-foot fence in the area in question. And so I move that we approve project number, hop number 1028583 oh, at 12 East Melrose Street in Chevy Chase. This is Commissioner Burdett. I second the motion to approve this hop. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, and thank you for coming. Sorry you had to come all this way, but <laughs> appreciate it. Okay, the next item on our agenda is item number 1D at um, 16101 Oak Hill Road in Silver Spring. Is there a staff report? Uh, yes, there is, Mr. Chair. This is the 
staff report for 16101 Oak Hill Road, Silver Spring. It's also known as Edgewood Two. It was constructed circa 1858 with later additions, <clears throat> and the approximately seven and a half acre site was added to the master plan for historic preservation for its association with the prominent Stabler family um, and its vernacular architectural development. And uh, the Maryland Historical Trust determined that it was eligible for listing on the National Register, but not listed under Criterion A for its association with the Stabler family and Criterion C as a good example of mid 19th century vernacular Greek Revival farmhouse. Um, so just going back in the, the history, um, May 18th last year, the HPC denied a hop to remove the existing porch decking and replace it with AZEC finding that the material does not accurately reflect the characteristics or appearance of wood, and that the porch is a character-defining element of the property, uh, and that using a substitute material other than wood contravenes the Secretary of the Interior Standards. The Board of Appeals split decision uh, in October upheld the HPC's decision because a tie defers to the uh, deciding agency. Uh, the HPC held a preliminary consultation at the last meeting to discuss erratus as a potential substitute material for the wood porch decking, the HPC was able to evaluate sample boards during the hearing. So uh, this is to be reviewed under um, Chapter 24A8, um, particularly 24A8A, um, which are the instructions for when the commission is instructed to deny a permit, uh, 24A8B1, which involves um, substantial alterations to exterior features on historic sites, and 24A8B2, um, which evaluates whether the proposal is in character with the um, historic resource. And uh, standard six of the Secretary of the Interior Standards, which discusses um, the repair and replacement of deteriorated historic features. So again, the applicant proposes to remove the existing porch decking on the south and west facing porches and replace them with erratus tongue and groove flooring. Um, again, this is an example of erratus installed on a porch in Goshen, Alabama. So um, some of the questions raised at the last preliminary consultation were, how is this installed and what is the treatment for the end, ends of the, um, the boards? So erratus recommends that nails are pneumatically driven, uh, nails are staples, are pneumatically driven above the tongues at an angle. Now, this would leave no visible fasteners. And then uh, at, at the end pieces, Aratus manufactures a trim piece that they call a chamfer nose, um, and it gets installed underneath the boards, and it uh, obscures the, the porch edging, as you see in the image in front of you. So again, just to familiarize yourself with the property, this is um, the view from, from the, the roadway to the south. This is from the west. You see the, the west porch and the south porch under construction. And you can already see uh, some of the degradation and mold on the porch. So just to give you some background on substitute materials, um, HPC first considered substitute materials appropriate for building additions and new construction in districts and at master plan sites because the materials were determined to closely approximate the appearance, installation methods, and physical characteristics of the traditional materials. Hardy plank siding, AZEC trim, architectural shingle roofing, aluminum clad wood windows were some of the earliest substitute materials approved by the HPC. In addition to approximating the appearance of the traditional building materials, the preservation field sort of writ large determined that these materials are appropriate method of differentiating the new construction from the historic. So the HPC has not approved substitute materials on historic constructions at master plan sites where there is a tactile interaction. The HPC has approved some of these materials such as trim or roofing or on building additions at master plan sites. And again, the HPC has approved erratus in select locations on buildings and historic districts, um, but these locations have all been adjacent to new or non-historic building elements and not replacing historic fabric. So staff finds the wood porch decking is a significant feature of the house and should be retained under the requisite guidance. The existing wood porch flooring was replaced several years ago and is already showing signs of degradation and rot. And there are some signs of drainage issues around the porch that may be contributing to the porch deterioration. Staff finds that wood tongue and groove flooring is widely available. 
Um, but staff recognizes that the quality of wood available today is not as durable as the wood available even a few decades ago. But staff also recognizes that wood decking develops some patina over time. The edges of the woods tend to soften and erode, as does the paint, whereas the appearance of substitute materials rarely develop that patina. Um, additionally, staff finds that the county council established the historic preservation tax credit to assist property owners in the maintenance and repair of their historic properties. This credit helps to narrow the cost gap between using historically appropriate materials, which may need repair or more frequent replacement, and an incompatible modern material. So the uh, National Park Service issued a preservation brief in 2006 on preserving historic wood porches that provides some of the guidance and encourage authentic authenticity and material integrity when maintaining and repairing significant historic properties. Uh, some of those excerpts were in the staff report. Uh, again, a reminder, standard six states that deteriorated distinctive materials should be replaced with, excuse me, with a material that matches the design, color, texture, and where possible materials. So staff finds that the proposed material is an inappropriate substitute for a character defining feature on a master plan site and meets the requirements of chapter 24A8A. Therefore, staff recommends that the HPC deny the hop. Um, just to, to walk through, staff finds that replacing the porch decking will substantially alter uh, an exterior feature on a historic resource which contravenes 24A8B1. Uh, staff does not find the proposed material to be a compatible substitute material at a master plan site which contravenes uh, B2. Staff does not find that this proposal will provide an additional protection to or alleviate a hazard on the site which uh, is covered in uh, 24A8, B3, and 4. Uh, nor does staff find that the owners will be deprived of reasonable use or suffer an undue hardship as required by 24A8, B5. Uh, undue hardship is sort of a term of a legal term of art that um, basically would deny that owner all reasonable or beneficial use of his or her property. And lastly, staff does not find that the public is better served in approving the HOP, which is a consideration under 24A8B6. Now at the preliminary consultation, a majority of the commissioners indicated they could support the HOP provided outstanding concerns were satisfied, including the exposed edge treatment, installation methods, et cetera. So if the HPC makes a finding contrary to staff's regarding the significance of the porch decking as discussed earlier, the HPC must find the relevant statutes for citation. If that is the case, staff recommends that the HPC condition the approval to require of the, the installation of the Erratus Traditions line because it has the highest paint adhesion. And with that, I will answer any questions. Any questions for staff? Commissioner Burdett. Uh, is, the e, is something like EPA considered acceptable as a replacement? Because it is very uh, durable, but it also doesn't take paint. Correct. Um, when you know, we've had consultation with, with the applicant in the past, and, and this was discussed a little bit at the preliminary consultation. Um, we, as, as um, staff, would have approved basically any wood species as an in-kind replacement that did not require a hop and was eligible for the county's preservation tax credit. Uh, the applicant was concerned about maintenance and more frequent replacement and repair and, and degradation considering this porch lasted such a, a brief period of time. So um, we considered it, we recommended it, but that was not something that the applicant was interested in pursuing. Thank you. The questions for staff? Right. Commissioner Pelletier. Thank you. Um, is there any discernment between vertical materials and horizontal materials on a historic building? We haven't taken a stance on that. I mean, I think we recognize that <coughs> horizontal materials, if they're not installed properly, would not shed water. Um, so that could lead to damage more quickly. Uh, but the HP, but- There isn't any sort there, of- There isn't any consideration of the orientation of the material installed. Okay, or the 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 amount, the visual amount of it, like. Correct. Like, okay. There is there is not. Okay. Thanks. Other questions for staff? 
not, I would invite the um, property owners and representatives to come forward. And I have Lisa Berry, Barry Godelski, and Stephen Godelski. So if you could all come forward, or as many as you are here. <laughs> and uh, again, if you could state your name, um, turn on the microphone and state your name for the record, that would be terrific. Thank you. Stephen. And, and you can uh, do a presentation, answer questions, whatever your preference. If you choose to do a presentation, you will have seven minutes. Stephen Godelski. Lisa Berry. Um, I guess it's up to you whether you feel we need a presentation. I could do something really. No, it's quick. up to you. Okay. All right, <laughs> you let me do if it you'd then. like to do a presentation, we'd welcome it um, seven, within seven minutes. Thank you. Okay, just going over the staff report, I just want to highlight a few things that. It says uh, in the Montgomery County Code, you know, one of the items is the proposal will not substantially alter the exterior features of a historic site or historic resource within a historic district. And I don't feel that this is altering the exterior features. It's uh, when we presented a wood sample, we didn't bring you a wood sample, but when we presented a wood sample and a aratus sample to the Board of Appeals, they couldn't tell the difference. So I don't feel like it's, you know, changing the appearance of the exterior features. Um, and the reason we didn't uh, include the trim pieces, because we feel that's not historically correct because I don't believe the original uh, house had that trim, that chamfer nosing on the front. Um, it was suggested that we try something like cedar or redwood that resists rot, but a woodworker article that I provided in one of the reports, it says white cedar only lasts two years, red cedar lasts three to five years, and Redwood lasts about three years when, you know, exposed to, you know, outside. Um, and the reason we didn't go with the Okoya or the Ipe, uh, mainly because they recommend an oil coating. And then the, um, the Okoya, especially when you looked at their guidelines for um, too many papers um, preserving you know the wood it was just on and on about you know make sure you clean it several times a year and you know it, don't place anything permanent on the deck and all these different things I uh, I can't find that paper right now anyway. And uh, it's, then it recommend that we prime, if we use wood, prime or stain and seal all, all six sides. And we had did that, we had done that on the two previous porches when we installed them. Um, it stated that, you know, we didn't give a, an example that was Um, approved by the National Register, by the standards. The Oak Hill Plantation property that I gave in the report, there was a letter that um, from the uh, let me find that. Here it is. The state of Louisiana where they wrote uh, they wrote to the Oak Alley and they said, thank you for inviting us to visit the Oak Alley on September 12th. As you know, Oak Alley, Oak Alley is a national historic landmark and one of the most important architectural assets in our state. Changes to the historic material not considered lightly. With that being said, we believe that a radius flooring product that you showed to the staff would, when painted, be a suitable replacement material for the wood boards. Standard six of the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation states, deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. 
where the severity of deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature, the new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities, and where possible, materials. Replacement of missing features shall be su substantiated by documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. We believe that the product as proposed will meet this standard. Thankfully, tens of thousands of people, of thousands of people will visit Oak Alley each year, causing an extreme amount of wear and tear on the traditional wood floor gallery floors. This plastic composite product will be able to withstand that amount of stress while ma maintaining a, an historically accurate appearance. And thank you again for letting us visit your property. Um, and then a lot of times when I would read previous reports, it would say how, uh, you know, certain things are not uh, approved because, you know, they're vis visible to the public. But the house sits 88 feet back from Oak Hill Road and 286 feet back from 198. So we're not really, it's not really visible to the public that anyone would ever notice that. I don't think they'd notice at 10 feet that it's not really wood. Um, uh, let's see. You know, it's stated that okay, okay. and um, I don't know. I kind of feel like Akoya. If we would use Akoya or Ipe, I don't think that's a very historically correct material either uh, for a house of that age in Montgomery County. Um, there was talk about at the last meeting that the arrayus did not fit together very well, like wood um, tongue and groove. And I took some pictures this morning of the tongue and groove that's presently on the porch. And I don't know, do you want to see these? I do you want to see them? Run those up there. If you could uh, sort of wind up your, your testimony, that would be terrific. Then okay. And answer questions. All right. Thank you. Um, and then I, I just wanted to say real quick, in the standards, uh, the state standards, it says, um, each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use changes that creates false or sense, a false sense of historical development, such as adding conjectural features or Architectural elements from other buildings should not be undertaking. And we're not adding anything that's going to change the architectural design. Uh, deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced, where the severity requires replacement. The new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities, and, and where possible, materials. Replacement of missing features shall be substantiated by documentary physical or pictorial evidence. And the replacement will match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities. And, be, and uh, so we feel that uh, wood is not a practical choice because of our. Thank you. Um, are you, would you uh, accept questions from us now? Yes, sure. OK, uh, do you want, anyone have questions for Ms. Berry or for Mr. Godelsky? Commissioner Burlett. Um Yes, thank you for coming today. Um, I drove out and on the road and looked at your house. I wanted to get a feel for it. Um, you have a ramp leading up to your front porch that is stone laid on a banked incline of a soil. Um, why did you, and it runs right up to the edge of the wood, is it truly banked soil there that is right up against the wood, or and there's, why did you do there's that? There's three quarter gravel in between, and I've left a space okay. right now because we're not sure how we're going to end. Okay. Uh, but there used to be brick all the way up the right side of that porch. 
Okay. Helpful. <laughs> Thank this you. This lot drains a lot better. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Pelletier. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, how many times have you replaced the wood on the front porch? Twice, and they, it lasted about five to six years before we started noticing the deterioration. Each time. Mm -hmm. And did you replace the original boards, or yes. were there never original boards? Yeah, the original board, which um, was the first time we've done it. Twice no, but like, the, like. The 200-year-old boards or whatever, or they like, no, oh, okay, so it's been replaced now. a bunch of times already. Oh, yeah. There yeah. were no, uh, there were no original boards there, and in fact, there were no, um, well, the only original boards we found were around to the left side, there used to be a sleeping porch, so under the structure that we redid, there was the thin tongue and groove. Oh, okay. So that's why we were originally putting on thin tongue and groove. But when we look back at the other pictures, it was one by sixes on the front porch, the oldest pictures we could find. Yeah, these the are what, this, these are pictures of what was. They have all that, Lisa. It's all on uh, the report. I found more of this today. <laughs> this is what was on the front porch. When you bought the house, okay. And were these new when you bought the house? Like, no. what, had it? fairly recently been? We have no idea. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm pretty sure they were pressure treated. Okay, thanks. Questions? Okay, if not, uh, we will begin our deliberations. Would anyone like to start off here with deliberations? Commissioner Pelletier. Thank you. Um, well, I, I sort of feel like, not sort of, I do feel like they're, they're not replacing original material. Like this, this porch boards are not, they're not, they didn't come with the original house. So I feel like the, the historic material is gone, long gone, long rotted away. And I think the erratus in, in this particular case, which I'm not saying we give sort of an across the board thumbs up to it, but in this particular case, um, I think it's a good substitute. And I, especially with this particular porch, you can't really see the porch. It's very low to the ground so, and it's far back from the road. And I think the distinctive part of the porch are the roof and the columns and and I would feel much more strongly about like siding or shutters or whatever that we're talking about but I I could support this material painted for the porch without the without the front band I think I just I feel like it's a good substitute in it I could approve this thank you anyone else Commissioner Burdett. Um, I'll take the opposite approach. Um, <laughs> and, and I don't mean to belabor the process that you've been going through, um, but I would, I, I would have liked you to have tried Ipe. And I say that because I have two porches of Ipe and they're 20 years old. And one is covered and one is uncovered and exposed in the sun all the time. Um, they're not on as close to the ground as yours is. Uh, I will um, say that. But and they also weather to a gray that is very similar to the gray on your photographs. Um, Ipe is a, 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 a not a native wood to North America, but the density and hardness of it is very similar to what you would have found in America in the 17 or 1800s still, in some areas. Um, our lumber these days is just not allowed to harden, you know, to grow slow enough to create the kind of lumber that was, that built these old houses. And that is why so many of these old houses, the wood is still there, the windows are still there. 
and they may not be in great shape, but they are still there and they are hard as rocks because of that old wood and because it's been sitting there for so long. You're not going to get that from any common pine lumber anymore. And to get it from even some of the hardwoods, are, it's going to be really hard to find really old growth wood anymore. And Ipe is a close approximation to, and it's even harder than what the old wood would have been that would have been originally on the porch. Um, and I think it would be an appropriate try. And you know, if the previous porches have lasted you three to five years, the Ipe would last you 20 years, uh, probably. And it's worth a try. So that, that would be my opinion. And I'd like, you know, I, I would recommend that you give it a try. Um, see how it goes. Because it, it will last a lot longer than your common pine. Can I respond to that? Sure. Okay. Um, we, at the last meeting, we uh, talked about that, and I uh, relayed that I had done a lot of research on the EPA, and it, I, it does gray, but it depends on the exposure to the sun, and so it's good to gray in certain areas where this, and, and not gray, like, where the sun doesn't reach, and they... I watched a video where they put an oil finish on it, and it was beautiful. It was just like, it looked great. And he uh, put it out in the sun for 12 weeks. He did a, he did, he, yeah, he, it was a 12-week trial, but each week it would lose its color. And by the 12th week, it was almost like he didn't put any oil stain on it at all. So we really don't want to put something that ugly on our porch that's going to gray, you know, more out where it's exposed to the sun and not gray up to the house where the sun doesn't reach it. So... Thank, thank you. And, any other? Yes. Commissioner Galway. Commissioner Galway. Um, I certainly listened intently to your presentation last meeting, and I thought you did a very thorough job, including bringing the material itself, that I guess you put together on a sample board. Um, there's a couple comments that I, I probably are repeat from last meeting, but um, the, the fact that these are not the original floors, uh, decking, I agree with Commissioner Pelletier that, you know, if this had been original, it would have been a lot harder for me to, to consider some s a substitute. I do think the fact that you're going through these cycles of four or five year replacements, given the location, elevation to the ground, uh, you're going to continue to do that. And so my comment last time is that I could support it, not as a precedent for all other homes, but given the, the difficulty that you're having. And I think the product itself of, of the ones that we evaluated, I think it looks as most and feels most like that of, an, of a wood product. Um, the fact that it's, it is reversible, so that if, you know, that once it's down, given that it's not the original uh, flooring or decking, it could always, you know, we could always, you as owner could always say, I'm going to go back to hardwood. So it's, it's a reversible process. I think that gives it some, some um, uh, support. Um, and I'm not convinced that it substantially alters um, the, the view itself. So I, I know it's tactile and you would, you would walk on it, but the product that you brought in seems as stable as a wood product. So um, I think I could support it. Thank you. That sample is here. What else? Any other, any other comments? Would anyone make, like to make a motion? I will attempt to make a motion. Okay. Go uh, for it. I move that the Historic Preservation Commission. I'm going to give the hop number. Okay. And the address, and, and then the reason, and then the. Um, let, let, can I just, I just, may I ask uh, something from the, from the floor, from the dais here that we need to have a, uh, a reason why we are approving something that is not, that is. That we're, where we're at, where the staff is asking for a denial, correct? In any motion that the HPC makes, you must adopt facts and findings right. to support your rationale. 
and then cite standards within the ordinance that are then supported by your facts, findings, and conclusions. The staff report offered a certain set of facts, findings, and conclusions to come to one decision. If you choose to make a different decision, you must state your own fact findings and conclusions for the record, and then cite those provisions of the ordinance that, that are then supported by those findings yeah, for the record. Okay. Hang on a second, we'll, we'll get the information for you. And while you're looking, I'll add as well, that if you want to make any conditions on your approval, the same logic chain has to follow and they have to be clearly articulated for the record. I have that. What I need is, what I need is a, uh, the, Here you go. There's the, there's the property. Someone, would someone else like to make a motion? You good? No, I, it's this part of it that I. At least one. Just pick one from oh, each okay. one. Just pick one from each one. Okay, and then we talked about yeah, six. six. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so just say. Okay, let me give this a go. I move that the Historic Preservation Commission in accordance with the standards set forth in section 24A of the Montgomery County Code approve HOP 1028853 at 16101 Oak Hill Road, Silver Spring, uh, located in uh, master plan site 15 slash 42 Edgewood 2, uh, I hereby adopt the rationale st stated in the staff report uh, with the added condition that the, I don't know how to pronounce it, is Commissioner, oh. Commissioner Pelletier, yes. if you adopt the rationale in the staff report, the rationale in the staff report was to deny yeah. oh. the permit. So I hereby. Just want to make sure you. Yes. Yeah, again, the, the logic <laughs> the logic chain, you okay. start off on the right foot with that. Uh, you have to adopt your own rationale, your own facts and findings under the provisions of 24A8B1 right. through uh, 6. Yes. I hereby adopt the rationale, the following rationale. Um, Finding the project is consistent with Chapter 24A, 8B, number one. Uh, the eritis will not substantially alter the historic features of the house. And Secretary of, S Secretary of Interior Standards number six, uh, deteriorated features are repaired rather than replaced. Um, 
and historic materials should be replaced if, if possible, where possible. Um, I move uh, that we approve this hop. Okay. First of all, does, every, does everybody on the, on the commission understand the <laughs> motion? Okay. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Rado. I second. Thank you. And I think with this one, I would like to do a roll call, starting on my left. If you could say yay or nay, give your name, whether you vote yay or nay on this, on this project. <clears throat> this is Commissioner Rado. I vote that we approve okay. the motion. Commissioner Haynes, nay. Commissioner Burdett, nay. Commissioner Pelletier, yay. Commissioner Galway, yay. Commissioner Nasser, nay. Commissioner Dominiani, yay. Chair Sutton, yay. Which I believe is five to three. Four. One, two. Five, five to three. Five to, five to three, three correct? Five yes. to three. The motion passes. passes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thank you for all thank the effort you, you put much. forward, and, and I hope, I, I look forward to seeing this, um, this product. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next project is uh, Project 1H at 10212 Montgomery Avenue, Kensington. And is there a staff report? Uh, there is, Mr. Chair, we'll, we'll go through this. Um, there have not been any um, questions raised, but the reason we're holding a hearing on this project tonight is because this has been something that has been contemplated for the last 15 or so years, and it is uh, the most prominent building in the Kensington Historic District. So um, we're excited to see this building here, and we're recommending approval of the hop, not to steal the conclusion, but we'll walk you through this. So. Uh, the house was constructed circa 1890 with a 1910 or 1914 carriage house. It's a primary one resource in the Kensington Historic District. And the proposal is for a comprehensive rehabilitation, partial demolition, building addition, and then additional site work changes. So the standards of review are Chapter 24A8, the Kensington Master Plan Amendment and the vis vision of Kensington, and the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, particularly standards two, nine, and 10. Just to review, uh, standards two focus on retaining the historic character and of the property. Standard nine um, encourages new additions and construction to be differentiated but compatible with the historic. And standard 10 um, says that new additions should be undertaken in such a manner that if they're removed, the essential form and integrity of the historic property would be unimpaired. So again, just to familiarize yourself with the property, a quick walk around. And the carriage house. So the house was constructed by Brainerd Warner. He's the founder of Kensington. It was, this was originally as a summer house. And it served it as, as an assisted living facility with a large addition on it for the latter part of the 20th century. And the historic house has not been used since ownership was transferred to Montgomery Parks. And just a reminder, the HPC held a preliminary consultation, the March 22nd, 2023 meeting, focused primarily on the placement size, scale, and massing of the proposed building addition. And the HPC was supportive of the proposal. So again, so uh, you see in the 1924 Sanborn on the left, uh, sort of the original configuration of the house. And then you see the 1963, the very large assisted living addition uh, towards the rear and also the one on the east. So an archeological survey was completed. Potentially significant features included sections of historic curbing, a mound corresponding to a, a possible previous structure, and a well or cistern on the south side of the carriage house. Uh, the applicants altered the limits of disturbance for the project to avoid any impact on the identified areas. So the applicant proposes to construct 17 market rate condominium units within the mansion, carriage house, and proposed building addition. A full building rehabilitation is proposed for the mansion and carriage house, including a code compliant stairway 
that will be constructed in the rear of the mansion that projects beyond the existing wall plane. Uh, the, the proposed rear addition measures 59 feet 6 inches by 40 feet 6 inches and extends off of the modified L. Uh, additional hardscaping is required to satisfy parking minimums and meet safety code, uh, including fire access. So just, these are the elevation drawings submitted, including the building addition on the left, south. And this is the interior floor plan of the first floor. You see there's a, an entrance to the addition um, along with a staircase and an elevator, uh, all contained within the addition. And then the new staircase, if you can see the cursor, the new staircase is going here and will project beyond the existing rear wall plane. So um, staff finds the proposed slate roof will be repaired and replaced in kind where necessary, including its flashing. The staff finds the proposed siding work will not result in a visual or material change to the historic house. Um, because no ex historic exterior doors remain, staff finds the proposed wood doors are appropriate for the character of the house and surrounding district. Staff finds the proposed stair is necessary to satisfy contemporary code and will be installed in a section of the house that has been previously modified. So the applicant proposes to restore eight historic windows on the first floor. And then of the remaining 100 windows, uh, approximately a third of them potentially date from the time of construction. And uh, approximately two thirds are replacements or boarded up openings or have openings with louvers in them. Um, all of the windows have experienced, show signs of dry rot, deteriorated trim and or missing pieces. And most of them are painted shut, which is just something that happens over time. Uh, the applicant proposes to replace the existing windows with aluminum clad windows and configurations that match the existing or historic configuration. Um, staff finds that the aluminum clad windows are not appropriate to replace the historic wood windows on such a significant resource and recommends the HPC at a condition that the replacement windows need to be wood. Um, the applicant has proposed in recent correspondence that one over one win wood windows are acceptable in the historic house. Staff supports this suggestion, finding that one over wood, one windows are period appropriate, and the change in mutton profiles where it can be documented is of less importance than the installation of an all wood window in the most architecturally significant house in the district. Uh, just walking through some of the other materials, most of the other materials would be repaired or replaced in kind, including the siding roofing doors. Um, again, the, the eight historic windows that will be restored are shown here. Uh, this is the front elevation, one, two, three, four, five. And then, um, actually, that one's counted, number eight's counted twice. But the final three windows are located on the east elevation here. Uh, again, uh, consistent with the, the HPC's feedback, staff finds that the addition size placement and massing are consistent with the design presented at the preliminary consultation. The primary change to the design is to the hyphen. The, present, uh, the design presented at the Preliminary consultation was primarily glass and aluminum. Uh, some of the commissioners uh, expressed that they were concerned that the appearance would be too commercial. Um, the applicant has revised that design, so it's now fibered cement clapboards and sash windows that align with the, the staircase. You can see the image in front of you. Staff finds um, the, the exterior of the um, addition is both fiber cement clapboards and hardy shakes. Uh, staff consistently maintains that hardy shakes are too thin of a profile to be an acceptable substitute material and recommend the HPC include a condition for approval that the fiber cement shingles be at least a half an inch thick or that wood shingles be used. Uh, so the provisions to the carriage house. So the circa 1914 carriage house will be converted into two residential units and a fitness center. The applicant proposes to remove and replace the existing roof, windows, doors, and siding. Um, the applicant has agreed to remove consideration of the solar panels that are shown in the south elevation, which you see in the uh, lower right. So the doors will be wood and match the appearance of the existing. Windows will be aluminum clad, multi-light sash and casements. The siding will be fiber cement, board and batten, and the proposed roof will be a, a box batten system roof. So staff finds that the proposed wooden doors are consistent in appearance and materials with the historic doors. Um, staff additionally finds that the proposed aluminum clad windows are appropriate because the carriage house has always been subservient to the mansion 
and has a lower level of detail and finish. Staff finds that the siding has deteriorated, but does not find the fiber cement board and batten to be, uh, does not, uh, but finds the fiber cement board and batten siding to be inappropriate and recommends the HPC add a condition that the siding be salvaged if possible and the remainder be replaced in kind with wood siding. Staff finds the proposed box batten roof is incompatible with the appearance of a historic standing seam metal roof. Uh, in this, the, the seams or the battens are effectively one and a half inch squares, whereas um, the seams would be, have a much narrower profile. So staff recommends the HPC add a condition that a replacement metal roof closely mimics the appearance of a traditionally constructed metal roof. And that can be accomplished either by having an um, installed standing seam metal roof or using uh, a standing seam system that is more consistent with uh, the profiles of a historic roof. So uh, site work includes expanded parking areas and associated curbs and lighting, widened driveways for emergency vehicle requirement, stormwater management, which is done both through dry wells and bioretention and bioswales, and tree removals. Um, just, just to walk you through, the four of the proposed tree removals are right here in the entrance where um, the driveway apron needs to be widened to accommodate emergency vehicles. Uh, two trees are immediately adjacent to the carriage house where uh, a transformer station is going. And we've got one tree here next to the bioswale and then lastly one that would be impacted by the construction of the building addition. The Kensington Local Advisory Panel submitted comments on the proposed project. The LEP was in substantial agreement with a staff recommendation and included the following recommendations, uh, that the windows be uh, true divided light windows, a request for more information about the external HVAC units, and that there be additional plantings around the proposed bioswales to obscure it and obscure the parking. So staff finds the proposal will be compatible with 24A8B1, 2, 4, 6, and D, and standards 2, 9, and 10, and recommends the HPC approve the hop with the following conditions. Uh, these are all detailed in the staff report, and there are a number of them, so you may want to follow along with the report. Uh, the first is the window replacements in the historic mansion shall be wood. The proposed hardy shakes in the carriage house are too thin to be an appropriate substitute. Wood or fiber cement shakes thicker than one half inch need to be installed. Uh, the half round louver in the carriage house may not be removed. We can actually strike that because the proposal is to install a window behind the louver, so the louver would still be visible from the right of way. Uh, the box batten roof is not compatible. A traditionally assembled or compatible standing seam system needs to be installed in its place. Uh, the railing design for the rear of the carriage house was not submitted. Detailed for this railing need to be submitted to staff for review and approval. Uh, additionally, the approval of this hop does not extend to the proposed solar panels. Uh, so number seven is the board and batten siding on the carriage house needs to be replaced in kind and permit drawings need to reflect the correct material and uh, to mitigate the loss of the, the nine trees proposed for removal, nine new trees need to be planted on site. And I will answer any questions that you have at this time. Any questions for staff? Commissioner Galway. Yes, Commissioner Galway. Um, the, um, do you know anything about the actual size and type of trees that are being removed? Um, that was all detailed in the site plan. I think I can pull some of those up in the staff report if you'll give me just one second. Unfortunately, the largest tree is this one, which is immediately adjacent to where the addition is going. Um, so its removal seems unavoidable. Um, it would frustrate the purpose of, of the project. Maybe that's a better question. Are, are all the trees is it unavoidable? To based, based on my opinion, yes. Okay, that's, that's fine. And then the second question I have, did you receive additional uh, information on the railing design behind the carriage house? Not yet. Okay. I, I mean, it, it, the proposal is for new wood stairs and a wood railing. So as long as it's a simply detailed wood railing, um, we're comfortable with that. And, and that would be reflected in the permit documents, the permit set of drawings that the applicant would submit post hop approval. Got it. Um, just to familiarize yourself with the process, if, if we haven't gone through this before, um, the reason that plans and architectural drawings are required at this point 
is so the HBC can evaluate the appearance. Um, after the approval, the applicant then develops the mechanicals and the structurals and the electrical plans, and a full set of permit plans is submitted to our office to review. We then stamp them and issue an approval memo and hand them back to the applicant, and those are the documents that the applicant takes to the Department of Permitting Services for final permitting. So as long as it's accurately reflected in the permit drawings, um, we feel comfortable with that and encourage the HPC to delegate approval authority to staff. Okay, thank you. The questions for staff? Commissioner Pelletier. Uh, thanks. The, the shingles that we were looking at earlier, are those, oh, this is not this project. Never that's, mind. that's a, a later project. Thank you. <laughs> but I think they would be appropriate for this project as well. Any other questions for staff? If not, I would invite the property owner and representative to come forward. And I have, um, let's see here, Carl Vogelman and William, is that right? Vogelmeyer. Vogelmeyer, I'm sorry, and William Morris. And if you could come forward and, and um, turn on your mic and state your name for the record, that would be great, and you'll have seven minutes to do the presentation. Uh, I'm Carl Vogelmeyer. I'm Frank William Morris, architect. I, I wasn't necessarily prepared for a proposal either, but <clears throat> I do have a proposal that I will be uh, uh, you know, going over. I mean, just the general details of uh, the process of the project, obviously, uh, you know, it's been a, and a, tell me if I'm saying this uh, uh, wrong or inappropriately, but, um, you know, it's been a long time, four years, we've been working towards uh, this day in which um, we've been working with all of the stakeholders, the mayor's office, the Friends of Warner Circle, um, obviously Parks, HPC, <coughs> Maryland Historical Trust, which has stepped out of the uh, process actually just recently with the extinguish, extinguishment of, a, of the easement. Uh, that they had and you know we'll be dealing more closely with uh, HPC on this you know we're looking forward to uh, moving uh, the project forward you know, via breaking ground you know as you may or may not know we've done this a few other times at the uh, National Park Seminary successfully um, you know we're very very excited um, about uh, giving back <laughs> some to the community to make parts of the uh, mansion and the carriage house usable uh, the fitness center will be uh, a de facto recreation center when the uh, town uses the um, facilities. Also, the uh, mansion itself will house a uh, small but uh, neat uh, historic uh, high uh, standard uh, historic restoration of the uh, foyer, which will uh, double as an uh, interpretive uh, museum for the public to um, use during the events. Um, furthermore, of the 17 units, um, uh, two of them, I believe, are ADA compliant. We're going to have ADA compliant ramps. You know, we've had a few questions that um, you asked previously, and we have some answers for those. Um, you know, we talked conceivably about doing some uh, geothermal work, uh, actually. And um, we did speak to the um, civil engineer and he recommended no geothermal because of the trees in the area. He believed because of the height of where the geothermal well would be drilled or where they would all be drilled, uh, you know, the downhill runoff would damage the trees. So we've sort of abandoned that. Um, uh, obviously, we addressed the uh, hyphen with uh, a reduction in um, kind of a commercial look, but more of a residential look. And the uh, notes that um, we were provided in the sense of the conditions, uh, the staff recommendations, I mean, obviously, um, you know, this isn't anything we can't figure out together as a team in the sense of thickness of shingles or wood windows and so forth. But, you know, our whole uh, bend on doing these historic restorations, and we're one of the only companies that do this, is to do them to the degree that the, the owners who move in aren't, you know, bothered by the, the owner next door, uh, you know, due to new noise considerations, and also that they're um, very, very energy efficient. 
We're going to be, in all probability, going after um, the uh, green building um, uh, code. Um, clearly on the addition, we're not sure yet on the um, mansion, but we will be meeting with those uh, DPS officials in the next two weeks. Also, we have a, uh, a meeting with DPS as it pertains some of the actual drawings, uh, life safety issues, for instance, how to get out of the building quickly and if the staircase is large enough. We, we believe that they are. Uh, obviously, the, the, uh, the space will be sprinkled and so forth. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, an approval and you know, moving through the DPS process. Bill? <clears throat> I would. I would add to that <clears throat> that it's a wonderful challenge working on this building. It has a lot of moving parts and pieces, and uh, it, we, we love a challenge, and we're really excited about bringing this to fruition. To the point, though, on eight conditions, we, we agree uh, with all of these, and I think it's a matter of uh, details to, to get to the point where uh, everybody's happy with the result, the thicker shingles, et cetera. We're, we're in agreement with all that and understand it and are, are willing to work with staff to, uh, to meet those conditions. Thank you. Any questions? Question. Commissioner Pelletier. Um, I, I'm hoping this is relevant. Um, I, I think these units are cool. I think the whole like concept, the condo concept is great. Um, I'm curious about, is there some sort of forward-looking, um, of what am I trying to say? I'm, I'm concerned about the post-maintenance, that like the post-move-in maintenance. Like it's beautiful, it's all gonna be new, whatever, but like with the new condo association, like are there plans to, for the management of this this it's an excellent excellent question thing. frankly and it's a very uh difficult question to answer <laughs> you know as the developer i'm going to try to build this building to the highest standard so specifically that everyone's satisfied once that takes place um for instance we did the gymnasium at the national park seminary we're still the property managers of that space um you know and i believe that every condo um, <clears throat> bylaw is written differently <laughs> than the next one. And I know that, um, you know, it operates and continues to operate like a nice Swiss watch because I, I'm still on that um, uh, case, if you will. Uh, you know, my firm manages the gymnasium. So um, I think it's an excellent question. Um, and, you know, on the way here, I was thinking about how can I make the bylaws better for the new owners? <laughs> and one of the thoughts I had was that, you know, we could conceivably add clauses that would benefit um, the continuation of the, um, of the space um, and the, um, you know, outlook that it remains pristine. Um, and with that said, uh, I think that that would be an, an appropriate addition to a bylaw clause that would state that uh, the developer would be managing the space for five years. You're not sure where you are five years from now, but the fact of the matter is we have an excellent reserve uh, study already uh, accomplished. Uh, we're going to be, in all probability, putting $25,000 a year away in reserves like we do at the gymnasium. Um, and in fact, you know, the fees in, at that particular property have gone up 10% in the last seven years. And we, we've been managing that property for the last seven years. It is all about property management. It's about walking around and making sure that the trim isn't, you know, uh, the trim is painted and it's not peeling so it doesn't rot, uh, making sure that the windows close, making sure that the HVAC units aren't leaking onto the unit below. Uh, I assure you the references that I've provided for people that I've sold to would state that, that I really care about the property. Um, but in the sense of the future, uh, five years from now, I believe that the property will look as good as the day that I turn it over to the, uh, the, to the owners. Is that the plan, that you're going to manage it for five years? I, I believe years? That it needs to be. And one of, the, one of the projects that I finished recently, which was the power plant project, 
um, <clears throat> and the firehouse plus the music practice hall, a much larger project. I wasn't selected as the property manager. Um, you know, it's been a long three years, we'll just say. And uh, at the end of that time, which is in February, I believe they're going to ask me to come back and manage the power plant. Um, the mistake I made on the power plant uh, specifically is I didn't continue owning one of the condominium units. Um, here, I believe I can work around that by still selling them, but the fitness center itself would re become a condominium unit. So that would allow me to be on the board. Um, okay. And if I was on the board, um, I think that that would be part of the bylaws as well, that the developer would be on the board for the next five years. So I'm willing to put that forward and not walk away from something that, you know, I'm going to continue to, to value. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Pelletier, if I can just jump in and add, um, regardless, this would still be under the purview of the Historic Preservation Commission. So any, any issues that you see neglect occurring could be brought before, um, the owners of the property could be brought before you as a body and, and required to fix that up under oh, okay. effectively the demolition by neglect. I'm just or, thinking in terms of, because I've, I've experienced small condo associations before, like self-run, which I don't think this one, this is more units probably. It, I, I assume there would be a property manager and there would be some kind of oversight, but I just, it's a concern. New condo associations are kind of a concern as far as people knowing what to do about the building. So I was just curious where it's heading. So thanks. Welcome. Any other questions? I would welcome a... Are we going to deliberate? Blue, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> deliberate. Uh, do you want to like to kick this off? I will. Commissioner Burdett. Um, applaud your, your work here. I mean, we're all so happy about this because of the seminary. Um, but I do have a um, one thing I'm not real happy at seeing, or I just, the hyphen, especially the side that has the stair landing, those windows aren't doing anything for me. Um, I don't know if it's the size of them or the, pl the placement or what it is, but they just look clumsy. Um, I would recommend you take a second look at them and see if there's something about how they can be sized or configured or something to make them look less everything else looks so nice and then that one little slot of an of an elevation just looks a little clumsy and i know it's the landing and, and all but there's something not quite balanced there but other than that it looks great and that's my only comment anyone else Commissioner Haynes. Um, well, I'll, I'll piggyback on Commissioner Burdett's comment. Um, when, when it was all glass, uh, you were proposing an aluminum frame system, which we felt was a little bit uh, commercial looking. But I think we liked the idea of the glass or the amount of glass or the ratio of glass to solid. Um, but maybe more expressed in, in uh, for lack of a better statement, traditional window grid. Uh, may, maybe it's done with uh, trim boards. We create a framework and you then fill it in with, with, uh, with windows uh, that are more residential appearing than, than, than uh, commercial. Uh, I think I think maybe the reaction, and I had a similar reaction, is the uh, paired double hung windows. Uh, and I know it's um, not fully detailed at this point. I know there's still an element of of schematic about this, but um, how you trim it out on the on the existing side elevation of the mansion, there are ganged windows uh, that have uh, that are trimmed out, and in this case, they're painted dark. And so, as a grouping, uh, their expression um, differenti differentiates itself from the, from the siding. And I think maybe how you trim out those windows, maybe you create a, 
uh, facade uh, where you're uh, trimming out in a grid pattern. And then maybe the windows can be larger. Maybe they can be uh, almost floor to ceiling uh, somehow, or you integrate panels, uh, painted panels uh, uh, in between the two levels. But I, I think at the moment, uh, especially in the west elevation, I'm, I'm primarily looking at uh, the window seems squat relative to maybe the area, the solid surface of the wall. And so we, we like the idea of a lot of glass to differentiate that, uh, the mansion from the, the addition. But I think uh, it sort of went the opposite way where it's, or, or at least maybe in the detailing, but, but something's, I, I would agree that maybe another round of refinement there but overall, I applaud the project and support it. I'm glad that this resource is going to be uh, uh, restored and also utilized, the site being utilized for a larger purpose. So in general, I'm very supportive of it. May, may I comment on that? Sure. Uh, I think it's an excellent point. I believe that we went uh, almost 180 degrees from the most commercial uh, hyphen to a much more residential one. Um, and uh, obviously it's more of a hyphen extension hallway. Uh, the windows, I think, could be larger. They also could be ganged together possibly to maybe make it seem to be a little more um, hallway instead of residential behind it. Um, you know, we can support that and obviously provide a, a few elevation choices to uh, work through. And I'll just add a coda. The it, on the west elevation in particular, each of those levels on the connection are, have a ramp behind them. So we start at one end of the ramp, and then you're at different levels. So then that becomes a squat window. So I think we can maximize that yet. You can see the ramp sort of uh, hatched behind the, the windows that. themselves. Mm -hmm. that, that does present a challenge. Anyone else? Commissioner Galway. It's Commissioner Galway. Um, Having done some geothermal myself, I'm not quite sure I understand uh, unless the site itself is really tight up around the building and you don't have the opportunity to go beyond that. I don't quite understand why the tree roots would be an issue, but nonetheless, that's not a condition of, you know, I mean, your selection in the HVAC system will be what it is. My only, my only request is that you be very sensitive to the location of those condensing units in a way that as you drive into this magnificent site and up to this magnificent house that you don't end up seeing uh, either ugly screening or, or units, which would even be worse than that. So I just you know, ask that you be very sensitive to the location of that equipment, transformers, condensing units, uh, gas, uh, electric meters, whatever it might be. Thank you. If, if I may. Uh Clearly, uh, we did speak to the civil engineer about the uh, idea of doing geothermal. He was completely against it, and we're uh, uh, happy to get something even further to HPC just to confirm that. I mean, otherwise, we would want to move forward with the geothermal. Um, all of the compressors uh, will be hidden and be below grade. Um, there is a vault, an HVAC vault, uh, there are a few up on the roof between the addition and the um, uh, main building that won't be visible from the uh, site. Uh, the one concern would be the side of the uh, carriage house where the other uh, three compressors would be going. And possibly we haven't done our <clears throat> full understanding of how those are going to reside because, as you can see, they're not really shown. So possibly we'd be making a small uh, area way there along the side property and have them lowered and just to <clears throat> tell you about the um, the transformer which is to the uh, upper left hand corner of the um, carriage house that is going to be lowered into the grounds with a knee wall around it and vegetation versus sinking it into the ground which after speaking to pepco and the civil engineer you know they recommended that could be uh, an issue hazard wise, but we have addressed that by digging it into the ground uh, a little deeper than anything that we had proposed previously. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. 
Uh, Chair Sutton, I move that the Historic Preservation Commission, in accordance with the standards set forth in Section 24A of the Montgomery County Code, approve HOP number 1032588 at 10 to 12 Montgomery Avenue, located in the Kensington Historic District. I hereby adopt the rationale uh, and conditions stated in the staff report, finding the project is consistent with Chapter 24A8B, uh, numbers 1, 2, 4, and 6, and the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, uh, number 2, 9, and 10. Is there a second? Commissioner Haynes, I'll second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing this. Yeah, it's going to be great, much, ladies. <laughs> thank you. Before the applicants leave, if you wouldn't mind filling out the forms that we have down there in the front, the speaker slips, and anybody else um, that'll be speaking tonight, if you can also just fill out the speaker slips for us and then just hand them in at the dais. Thank you. Okay, the, the next project on our agenda is item 1K at 10221 Montgomery Avenue in Kensington. Is there a staff report? Yes, Mr. Chair and members of the commission, there is a staff report. Rebecca Ballow, for the record, this is hop number 1029631 at 10221 Montgomery Avenue in Kensington. So for some background, the property information and proposal we have tonight, this is a primary one resource to the Kensington Historic District located on the east side of Montgomery Avenue at the intersection with Carroll Place. So the address is very similar to the previous case. This is just to the east of, of the Warner Circle and also just to the east of the Noise Library for children. Um, the property was con constructed circa 1898 with its associated garage. The proposal this evening is for after the fact demolition of the original garage, construction of a new two car garage, and then we will also discuss some associated hardscaping. The standards of review are 24A8, the Kensington Master Plan Amendment with the Vision of Kensington, and the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. So there's quite a bit of administrative background on this case. It's detailed in your staff report, but I'm going to read a lot of it into the record as well, since this is an after the fact case and we don't get a lot of these. Um, so the HPC approved a hop for alterations to the original contributing garage constructed circa 1911 to 1924 from what we could see from the Sanborn maps on May 27th, 2020. In September, 2020, the HPC approved a staff item revision to the hop to add underpinning and the installation of a new foundation underneath the garage. Revised drawings were submitted to staff for final review and approval in May of 2021. In January of 2023, the Department of Permitting Services contacted the Historic Preservation Office with a service request regarding construction of the garage. It was determined that the applicant had demolished the original garage entirely and rebuilt a new garage, which their building permit was for a renovation permit. It was not for new construction. So DPS issued a stop work order against the building permit. HPC staff at that time determined that a new historic area work permit and HPC approval for the garage demolition and new construction was required before additional work at the property could proceed and the stop work order is still in place. So back to the historic garage. This is a one-story, two-car, hipped roof garage measuring approximately 372 square feet that had, there had been several previous alterations done to the garage prior to the establishment of the historic district. Um, these items were detailed in the staff report. Um, this is likely the gr original garage door opening, but probably not the original garage doors. Some of the siding had been patched. There was the addition of the, the newer driveway with the drain and the, there were newer asphalt shingles on the roof. I'm, I'm not going to go through all of the approved work from 2022, from 2020 and 2021. It's detailed in the staff report. We have it here um, to go back, but these are all of the alterations 
to the garage that were previously approved. Um, there was the replacement of the concrete slab, replacement of the doors. There was a small new addition to the right and the rear of the garage, two little additions that had been approved. And then again, with the staff item at the bottom, there was the approval to increase the height of the garage by approximately one foot four inches by adding a new CMU block foundation, again, to accommodate two car lifts inside the garage. And you can see in the attached architectural drawings those, those lifts as they raise and, and lower the cars within the garage space. So for your consideration this evening as a discussion item, um, it was submitted to the staff this letter from January 2023 um, that references a site visit performed by a structural engineer in December of 2022. So the general contractor um, stated in the historic area work permit that extensive insect and termite damage to the garage framing was discovered and that was the reason for the total demolition. However, this has not been documented or verified by the staff. Staff notes that a letter from the structural engineer indicates that the garage was structurally sound when it was assessed in December of 2022. Staff acknowledges that structural damage to wood frame garages from the early 20th century due to termites, wood rot, moisture is certainly not uncommon. Um, but again, based based on some items that we were unable to verify, the general contractor demolished the garage and then constructed the new garage that is the subject of this application. So the new garage, second piece of this. The proposed new garage is similar in size, scale, and materials to the previously approved garage with its alterations. Um, the currently proposed garage would be somewhat smaller to the one that had been initially approved by the HPC. There are smaller bump outs on the rear and the side. Um, the current proposal also adds an exterior stairway with landing and uh, handrail to the rear of the building, providing access to a new sub-basement for automobile storage. The height of the proposed new garage we believe is comparable to the original. We don't actually have heights on the original garage because it wasn't proposed to be demolished so we didn't ask for perhaps all those dimensions as we should have, but it seems to be within about a foot, foot and a half of what was originally intended. So the proposed materials um, include an asphalt clad hipped roof with a 12 over 6 pitch to match that of the original garage, parched CMU foundation, painted wood siding to match the original, and wood bifold doors to match those in the previ previously approved hop. Um, the submitted architectural sheets note that all materials will be wood. And other notes on the submitted architectural sheets note that windows and other historic building materials will be reused. However, staff um, finds that the submitted drawings showing several elements being retained and other details from the original structure being replicated do not represent the as-built conditions in the field. Specifically, the submitted photographs show that the historic windows were not reused as the drawings indicated. And the single windows in the garage now have a one over one configuration as opposed to the previously approved six over one and as opposed to what was shown in the drawing. So in the bottom you can see a picture of the original garage and on the top you can see the as built. The siding appears to have a five to six inch reveal as opposed to the narrower three to four inch reveal from the original that was proposed to be maintained. And the pool equipment that was proposed to be located inside the structure remains on the rear where it is exposed and unscreened. Also, the fascia board beneath the soffit is more substantial than what previously existed and appears to be several inches taller in profile. So what I'm talking about with the fascia board is up, up here versus here. And I don't believe that that is an issue with where the picture is being taken from. I think that the roof overhang is slightly different and I believe that, the, that, that this fascia board is taller. Oop, I went the wrong way, I'm sorry. So on the left is the rear of the original garage with the six over one window and the pool equipment screened. And then on the right is the rear of the new garage with the one over one window and the unscreened pool equipment. And you can also see on the right the stairwell going down to the sub-basement. The hardscaping, I'll go back one slide. So this hardscaping here was not shown on the previous, any of the previous hops that I could see, and it is unapproved. So that it's, I'm calling it unapproved hardscaping has been added between the house and the garage. I'm recommending a finding that the hardscape should not be approved as part of this hop, um, but that the applicant submit a revised site plan showing the hardscape, railing details, and other changes for review and approval 
at the staff level with a separate HOP application. So ultimately tonight, the question for the HPC is whether the demolition of the garage would have been permissible if it had come in for review with a HOP. To reiterate, structural information submitted by the applicant and previous site photos indicate the building was sound, though the current submittal states that there was unverified damage. It is possible that the HPC could have found, if this had been brought to you guys before the demolition, you could have found under section 24A8B4 that the demolition would have been permissible for safety reasons. However, staff believes it is more probable that the HPC would have requested at a minimum materials from the original garage be retained in the new construction and that any new building match the design and character of the original garage as closely as possible. There is no way to undo this demolition of a contributing structure and therefore staff is offering several conditions meant to replicate design aspects of the original garage in the newly proposed construction. Specifically, Staff is proposing additional conditions for the fenestration and siding with the goal of restoring some of the details that had been evident before demolition. Um, the proposal does convene standards two and nine, but again, staff can find based on the applicant's assertion of damage that the removal was necessary under chapter 24A8 before. The proposal is necessary in order that unsafe conditions or health hazards be remedied. And finally, it is important to note that the new building is similar in size, scale, massing, height, location, and materials as the original garage, and is somewhat smaller than what was previously approved as an alteration to that structure. Therefore, the new garage would not adversely affect the character of the house or the surrounding district as a whole. So staff recommends that the commission approve the HOP with six conditions under the criteria for is issuance in Chapter 24A, A, B, 4, and D. Having found the proposal will not substantially alter the exterior features of the historic resource and is compatible in character with the district and the purposes of Chapter 24A with the proposed conditions. I don't think I'm gonna read through all of the conditions for the record there in the staff report. You can see them here on the screen. They have to do with submitting correct as built drawings with accurate material notations and all four elevations, changing the fenestration, changing the siding, changing the fascia, screening the pool equipment, and submitting an additional hop application for all of the hardscape. Condition number six is a little bit of an unusual one, but I didn't feel, at least with the garage, we have a starting point in terms of what was built, what was intended, what it is in the drawings. I really don't have enough information about the hardscape in this hop to feel that I could condition an approval of that appropriately. But I do think it is, it is appropriate and approvable hardscape. So I didn't wanna hold up this application, but wanted to deal with that in a separate one where the applicant could detail everything appropriately and just have the staff approve it. So that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Commissioner Burdett? Did they get a demo permit? No. no. Any other questions for staff? Commissioner Galway. Commissioner Galway. Um, should we not accept this? <laughs> the, what happens? It sits in limbo without a permit, or what, what are the, what's, what alternative is there? That's an excellent question. There is a stop work order for an unapproved demolition and unapproved new construction. The remedy is for them to obtain the permit. If you were to, for example, deny the permit, they could appeal the denial to the Board of Appeals. Um, there's, I'm hesitant to sort of go any further with, with that because the stop work order would not be lifted by DPS. They need a valid permit from the HPC to get the stop work order listed, to, to, get, to get that lifted. So I think the HPC is in a bit of a spot. Um, that's not really a legal term, that's more, that's more my term with it. So that's one of the reasons too, we're, re we're recommending approval with a lot of conditions and if the HPC finds that additional conditions for you know to remedy this situation are necessary that is your purview to do so 
Thank you. Your Pelletier. So there's a stop work. What's left to do? I, I mean, just I don't I don't see all the pictures, but it looks kind of done. I think that's a question for the applicant. Oh, okay. Well, I'll bring that up later. I have a question. Mr. Burdick? Um, having, well, being one of the old timers on the commission, um, I do recall previous cases where the, the work was done without approval from us and a permit and was caught and had to be taken apart and then meet the requirements that we would put on it and then also DPS would put on it. So it's a hard lesson for people to learn that, you know, it can, it can be a very painful, expensive process. Although it's been a long time since we've done one of those, right? It has been a long time. Um, I'm thinking of the roof at the Magruder blacksmith mm -hmm. shop. Oh yeah, I forgot um, about that one. That yeah. was replaced without a permit, put on a standing, put on a copper roof that the mm. HPC determined was inappropriate. He had to remove it and put on a wood shingle roof. Yeah. There's another project in Somerset where we approved something. I can't remember the. I might address. have to ask Michael Kine about that, unless, Dan, do you remember Isn't that? Somerset? Oh, hard, was that the hardscaping case? Yes. Yeah. yes. We approved something, and they completely did something completely different. Yeah. Yes, and you approved a very limited hardscape and a porch, and they excavated out the entire right. front yard, and you made them regrade it and put it back some and narrow wanted, the driveway. Some of us wanted to deny the project. Yeah. But, yes, that was another one. Yes. And then there was the one where they had taken off the original siding of the house and put it in the dumpster. Oh, boy, that one was, oh, yes. Yeah. And the, yes. And the, and the, and the um, shingles, remember the? Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyhow, <laughs> reminiscing is fun, but yeah, it, it can. One of the key differences, if I may, between those cases is that, again, this is for the demolition of the resource you know, replacing a roof or the siding or the regrading, there are a lot of remedies to fix or to yeah. put things back. There really is, there's a new garage there. That's the yeah. only I mean, remedy, I guess you could say. But theoretically, we, we could say, you have to take it apart and put it back exactly like the old one was. You would need to make findings Again, as to point. to get there as to why what was constructed is not appropriate or detrimental to the district and why the only appropriate mm -hmm. structure for the district and for that house would be an exact replica of the garage as approved with your previous hop that still had those small additions to yeah. it and those other alterations. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff? If not, I'd welcome the property owner and, and um, representatives, and I have several names, McFarland Woods, um, Bruce Caswell, Laura Dykeman, and then uh, Mike Roberson, I see three, I don't see four. So if you could give me your names uh, for the record, uh, turn on the microphone, turn on your name, and then you'll have seven minutes for a presentation. Sure. Thank you. I'm, I'm Lauren Dykeman. I'm one of the homeowners. Bruce is not here. Thank you. Luke Olson, GTM Architects. Zach Khalifa. I am filling in for Mike Robertson tonight. Okay. Thank you. So if you'd like to do a presentation, we'd welcome to hear it. Sure. I think we all have a little bit to contribute. Um, I'm not going to say too much because I'm going to leave it to the building experts. Um, if you wanted to make me nervous, you succeeded. But I, I do want to say that my husband and I have lived in Kensington for 27 years in two historic properties. And you have a, a pile of hops from us. We have gotten approval from HPC for everything from, you know, tree removals to storm windows to additions to renovations. We have taken care of our homes. We care about them. And we are not the kind of people who are trying to get away with something and hide something. I recognize it's not a good look to get here this way, and I'm really sorry for that. It really was an oversight. It was not an intention. 
So I am, I am sorry for that. I hope that we can explain the process and then I really hope we can work together to come up with a path forward that we can all feel good about. I will leave it to the experts. <laughs> um, uh, Zach Leifa, I will be representing McFarland Woods and homeowners Bruce Caswell and Lauren Dykeman. Um, Mike Robertson, who oversaw the project, regrettably could not attend due to family health issues. Hi, Zach Khalifa, another project manager for McFarland Woods will be filling in. Thank you for letting me do so. Um, first, I would like to start with an accurate hot proposal. The proposal stated that the structural engineer demonstrated in a letter that the existing structure um, was structurally sound. Engineer Gus Radwan's inspection and letter was of the new garage in its as-built state at the time, framing, steelwork, et cetera. Therefore, and it's inaccurate for the staff, respectively, to use this artifact to support their assertion that the old garage was suitable to have remained. We are happy to provide further clarification from the engineer on this matter. Um, but given the previous state of the garage, our concern was mainly due to durability and maintenance on a detached accessory structure. With inadequate lateral bracing, the walls brace solely by non-structural siding, deflection in joists, and extensive water and insect damage, the garage was a hazard for anyone entering. We understand we did not go through the proper channels to construct a structurally sound garage, but in doing so, we tried to keep the spirit of the existing garage and create a functional space for Bruce and Lauren. Um, further, I guess, we're okay with almost all of the conditions that, that um, staff is proposing here. Um, there is one that we would just ask that you reconsider as a part of this, and I know that it's already a lot to ask. Um, and that relates to condition three relating to the siding. Um, we, we have some photos here that show the, the siding as installed. It's at four and a half inches reveal. And they're asking for three to four inches, and we, we feel like the, that distance isn't um, substantial enough to warrant completely residing the house. It's also um, pretty compatible with the existing house. It's, it's not something that's incompatible with the resource and, and close to what's there. Um, Further, kind of given the need to demolish the structure and the walls, the fact that there's no sheathing and that the siding was attached directly to the framing, that was insufficient and had to be replaced. Um, I, I see that this is going to be considered a new construction. And once it's considered a new construction, standard nine applies. And um, that would say that essentially it's appropriate to use uh, alternative materials and we would ask to be able to use the fiber cement material that's currently installed rather than wood siding. This is both a durability and maintenance thing. We're trying to avoid this issue occurring again. Um, it, it's also worth considering that when you see painted lap siding from hardy, like hardy panel or other fiber cement siding versus a wood siding, it's essentially the same once it's painted and maintained. And especially on a detached garage, mostly in the rear yard, far off from the street, not really close to public view. I, I bet most people wouldn't be able to tell that you just pull that that's, that's fiber cement, not wood siding. And this is an accessory structure as well that is typically subject to more lenient scrutiny as compared to if we were doing this to the main house, for instance. Um, so that being said, we just ask that you kind of reconsider condition number three, but we'd ask that you approve it with the rest of the conditions as stated in the staff report. Thank you. I guess I would just oh, add one, can I add one more thing? Sure. Um, just regarding um, number six, our rear hardscaping was modified from a hop we received in 2015 when we um, landscape our backyard and so uh, I would propose being able to submit updated uh, drawings and um, the elevations changed when the garage was installed and raised a little bit and so we had to redo our stairs and things I'd be happy to, to update if we could maybe revise the previously issued hop that would be great okay thank you <laughs> any any questions for the owner or owner's rep Commissioner Nasser. Hello. <laughs> I just want to clarify something. So the reason you did not ask for a hop and then just went ahead and did the construction was that it was falling apart and it was dangerous and it was you could not wait any longer to get the hop to get the permission. 
So is that true? Yeah, I believe after having the engineer come and visit and seeing how the structure was, how it was constructed, um, we decided to go move forward, regrettably slow. So um, we also had approved plans to dig up an underground garage. And in order to do so, the garage would have to move. So you wanted to just move with the... Yeah. So. All right. Thank you. We, we did have approved plans. Yeah. Right. We, but, and but, I came but home the one day and the garage was gone. The garage. <laughs> I said, yes. wait a minute, the garage is gone. <laughs> yes, that, that's what I meant. There yeah. we were, yes. All right, thank you. Commissioner Pelletier. Thanks. Um, is, I assume not, but there's no report, there's no structural report, photos of the damage, like evidence of of the condition that the that the garage was in. Um, we do have some photos that we are happy to submit. <coughs> okay, but you haven't submitted those up to now. Okay. Commissioner Burdett. Um, and you didn't even consider having the uh, project manager for you for your firm to write a letter to submit to the HPC saying this is what happened and we didn't seek a demo permit as the county would require. Um, nobody, nobody thought to like just even write a letter to us or to DPS. I mean, I... Uh, um, yes, regrettably so, we, didn't, we did not write a letter. I, I have to ask, do you do this on other projects? I mean, not get demo permits and not get permits for construction? No, we do not have a track record of that, no. I also don't believe a demo permit specifically would be required. There's, it's a change to the permit, but it's, it's not something that would require a, a demo permit per se. It would require drawings that accurately reflect the work, is, is how I would put it. And, and that's what we should have submitted. What was required, this is Rebecca Ballow for the record. The reason there was a stop work order put on the property is that when the inspector went out, there was not a permit for new construction. There should have been a new construction permit filed for the construction of the new garage because under the previous permit that was just a you know rehabilitation, it was not a new, a new structure that was being built. It was impermissible under the building permit that you had. I well, as I understand it, it's it's different from the building permit that we had, and there's a there's a slight clarification there, and, and I really don't think it's worth getting into. Um, the bottom line is we didn't come back, and we should have. We're trying to get to any any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Commissioner Galway. It's Commissioner Galway. Um, I I just would like some clarification, if you will, on why it was removed, it would help me a lot. I've heard durability and maintenance was an issue. I've heard insect damage, insect damage of some sort. Structural integrity because of the sub level that was being built and the need to have to remove or move, relocate the, the garage in of itself to accommodate the new construction. Is it all of those things or, or is it one of those things? Can you be clear for us? Um, I believe it's all of those things. Okay, thank you. Pelletier, uh, first of all, does anyone else, before we get to you, anyone else have a question? Oh, yes, yeah. Commissioner Haynes, then we'll get to you. Yes. Um, help me understand, was the sub-basement part of your original permit? Yes. Do we have confirmation of that? It's included in the hop drawings that we submitted. Yes, yes. The. The original the, permit that the, you, you got. For the the sub-basement um, was approved with a revised hop and was part of the renovation permit that was submitted to DPS. Mm -hmm. to, um, so it seems, to, um, I have to say, given your homeownership being there for 24 years, having applied 
several times for a hop, it's uh, a little disheartening that you didn't understand you needed to get a revision to the hop or that a red flag didn't come up when uh, the decision to tear the garage down. Uh, that's, that's a little disheartening. Um, as the architects, I would think uh, you would certainly have would have known that given your, your track record. So that's a little disappointing. Um, I, I can't help feeling that the existing garage was discarded in favor of a, a very extensive uh, garage structure for look on the building sections on drawing A300. I mean, this is no, this is no garage, uh, uh, typical garage. So, um, um, it's, it's very dis disheartening that you did not come forward um, once you decided you wanted to tear it down. There should have been red flags and should have been um, resubmitted. I would like to clarify a, a couple of things on that. Um, we weren't overseeing construction as the architect at, at that point in construction we weren't in, involved necessarily with that decision. But it, it's, it's not that we discarded a garage in favor of another much larger garage. We had approval to do additions and modifications to a garage, including the substructure. And how it's been explained to me, again, by McFarland Woods, is that this was a structure that had numerous structural defects to it. And I part understand of that. that. Part I of understand that. Work that. Was and there are ways to deal with that kind of structure. Um, we've seen that um, the general store on on old Georgetown, uh, can, same kind of situation. So I, explain, I don't buy, please? I don't buy, no, you cannot. Uh, I don't buy that there couldn't have been structural remedies for that garage, or at least it could have been discussed and so that the commission could have weighed the pros and cons. It actually should have been discussed. I believe the issue is that to pour the sub-basement, you had to lift that structure. And once you start moving that structure that is not structurally sound, that does not have sheathing, that has rotted wood, has water damage, it falls apart. And not only that, the lap siding is the sheathing on that structure. And so it starts racking and cracking. Like it's- Yeah, I understand. I understand all that. It's regrettable that we did not come back to you and we were sorry for that, but it, it is a situation that occurred and it was decided to move forward. Um, that was not the right decision. But we, it's not like we built something that is way outside of what was approved. In fact, it's slightly smaller per the staff report. It's just new and not the, the resource, and, and that is the issue. I, I have a question. Um, I one thing I don't understand. I mean, I'm, I don't understand why you couldn't contact us. That's we've discussed that. But what I also don't understand is if you're going to build a new garage, why couldn't you copy the one that was there? This doesn't look anything like the one that was there. And that's what I, that's another question that I don't understand at all. Again, that's, um... I think we'd be a lot more, I, well, personally, I'm not gonna say all of us, but I think I'd be more comfortable if I could look at this and say, you know, that looks like the garage is here. Maybe you have a case for demolishing the one, the, the former garage, but this one does not look at all, in my mind, like the one that was there, and I don't understand that part at all. I don't think it was, it wasn't meant to look like the one that was there, it was meant to look like the one that was approved post-modification. We had approved plans to modify the existing one and there, there stuck were some, very closely. There were to that. yes, but it still does not look even with the modifications. In my mind, does not look like what we approved. I was on the commission at that time. And right, it, they I don't, don't know how it's. Uh, it is. Well, I believe the the conditions that are set forth in the staff report that we're agreeing to are an attempt to bring it back to that condition, to bring it back to what was approved to make sure that the windows match, that makes sure that the, the eave trim matches. Like that, that's what we're agreeing to here and asking that you approve. Thank you. Uh, no. <laughs> one more. Okay. Commissioner Radu. Yeah, just uh, one question. I don't uh, recall looking at the previous hop, so I don't know exactly what was approved. And, but how, how did you 
think the work will be done. You, you thought that this will need to be, the old garage will need to be moved. I mean, you said you have drawings for new construction, so I'm like a little confused about like, what was the sequence that you anticipated and that couldn't be maintained? I think, given the fact that it was structurally unsound, um, we couldn't move the garage. So we did our best ability to make it resemble what was there before. Um, and with these conditions, we hope that we can bring back the spirit of the old garage. I would say that I wasn't involved in the, the historic review and approval of, of this project. I'm here for another meeting. I was going to be here. I wanted to, to testify and assist on behalf of, of my company. Um, I would suspect that we did not do a structural analysis of the garage to ensure that it was lifted, that it would remain uh, before we proposed the plan to lift it and get approval. And when it came time to actually build it and do that, it was determined that that was not feasible. And at that time, we should have come back. Thank you. Your Pelletier. I didn't want to ask my question anymore. Um, what, how did you arrive at this garage size, and how does it differ from the Old garage, because it, it, the pictures of the new garage look very similar to what I think you were proposing for the old garage. But what's the difference between the two? Like, is you said the new one is smaller? Um, like you've got twenty four feet by twenty four feet, including additions on on your original drawing uh, when you were adding on to the garage. What is it now? And, and how did you get there? We would have to do a field verification to know exactly what it is, but I believe it's essentially the same as what was proposed in terms of the size. Meaning so it the is. Ones, the, the garage plus the additions that were approved previously. Um, the main difference is this is not the historic structure plus additions. It's new construction. Um, it, it might be slightly taller. I'm not able to speak to that. I'd have to go measure to determine that. Um, it has trim differences, different windows. Oh, I know that. But there's been some talk about how this this is smaller. Is there a wall check? Yeah, did you guys do a wall check? Did you guys do a wall check? Um, yeah. Because that wasn't part of the... I'm, I'm sorry, Rebecca Ballow, for the record. I, is that one of the things... I hadn't thought to ask that in the report, and I'm sorry to jump in, but maybe... Do you have a wall check? Could you submit that tonight? I don't have it on me. I would have to verify that with the uh, Got it. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So, so yeah, that's my question because there's just been a lot of conversation about, um, and in the staff report about how this one is slightly smaller. So I was, so it seemed like something had to be redesigned before you could build this. But you're saying that it's essentially the same footprint. As the old garage, okay. Um, and uh, just for my own clarity, were you planning on jacking up the old one because you were going to raise it up and put a foundation underneath it, right? So was that was that the the primary way it was going to happen? You were just going to sort of raise it up, okay? And then it was it there was nothing there to raise up. Oh, yeah, hit your button there. Um, if we were to do that with the existing garage, we did see that it would fall apart, and we should have came forward. Did you try, and it started to fall apart? We did not try, but um, after having our en engineer reviewing it, I think it was not feasible. So whose decision was it to just knock it down? Was it the... I think it was... Um, us as the builder. Okay. Because it sounds like the owner was kind of surprised when she got home and she didn't have a garage. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this was kind of, was this sort of unilaterally something you decided to do after seeing that it wasn't going to survive 
being jacked up a couple feet? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner Burdett? Um, I, have a, I have a question. Looking at sheet A300 and that rather extensive excavation that needed to be done, did y'all have a approved permit for that? Yes. Wow. And if, I may say, if we, to dig that hole, that was involved underneath the structure itself, the garage. Mm -hmm. So that garage would essentially would have to be craned out and reinforced in order to do that. But with it not being structurally sound, that was not feasible. Um, but you would have known this going into this. I mean, I, I mean, I can look at that and think a little structure like that garage, even if it was in good condition, would have had to have been moved and jacked up and moved even into the backyard. Sure. You knew you had to move it. Mm -hmm. And yet you didn't bother to, I mean, uh, anyhow, um, that, that's my question. I'll be quiet. Any other questions? Commissioner Galway. This is Commissioner Galway. Do you know for a fact that you have situated the new construction with necessary setback from the, from the property line? Um, I believe so. We had surveyors come out um, to stake out the property. Um, but I can provide verification on that as well. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, uh, we will begin our deliberations. Would anyone like to kick off? Commissioner Haynes. Um, well, I, I think I sort of started my deliberation in my questioning of, of the applicants, but um, um, as I'll express just one more time, the sort of disappointment that we weren't notified once the change was, uh, that they felt they needed to make the, the change in the demolition. Um, I would really like to see some evidence. Uh, you said you had photographs. I'd like to see photographs uh, of, of the garage condition so that we can uh, confirm that, yeah, this was beyond being able to be salvaged or, or restored. Um, and, and so I would uh, really like to defer this case till we get the uh, photographs or any other documentation confirmation that the setbacks have been met um, and uh, be able to be satisfied that the structure was indeed um, un, unable to be, to be moved set, you know, safely and, and restored. Anyone else? Commissioner Burdett? Um, I agree with Commissioner Haynes that there is missing information here that needs to be provided um, for this. It's, um, as I said, when we started this, this is, we have dealt with issues like this before, but we have also dealt with exceedingly, amazingly fragile buildings that when the owner and the contractor realized how fragile it was, they called us immediately. And those buildings are still standing and still, I don't know the current state of the one, but, mm -hmm. um, and I'd, I would like to stress, you know, in that there is always the risk with historic properties of of demolition by neglect. And occasionally there is demolition by intent. And both of those are very serious situations because while the owner appears to be truly, you know, uh, uh, was shocked and upset, and you two are both, you know, apologetic, there are very many people, owners and architects and builders out there who would be more than happy to go down this path without anybody knowing about it. And we deal with that too. Um, so coming back to us, sorry, but gee, we'd like to go forward. Um, I, I, along with lack of permits and lack of notification and all the rest of it, you took it down 
and you kept on working long past the point of, in, of not even alerting us, but alerting DPS for crying out loud. I mean, that thing's almost done. You're missing, it appears that you're missing the enclosure around the, the pool equipment. You went a long ways past the point when, as professionals, you should have known when you should have contacted DPS. You should have known, as of the architectural firm, when to contact us. So I agree with Commissioner Haynes that there needs to be some more information. And if you have photographs, if you have letters that you can provide, I would recommend you do it. And as uh, was requested further down, um, proof of setbacks, proof that you are meeting the requirements for the and, and structural, you know, you're just sitting here saying we're sorry and you're not proving to us that even what you've built is appropriate and is, and is factual. So thank you. Who else? Just, just want to. Commissioner just, Radu. This is Commissioner Radu. Just want to add, this is like, want to make clear that this is a new construction at this point and that everything needs to be required to be to meet the new construction code and everything else. Is there a motion from anybody? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I move that the HPC defer hop number 1029631 at 10221 Montgomery Avenue, Kensington, that the applicant submit photographic documentation of the existing garage structure uh, to show uh, rot and uh, disrepair. Also to show evidence that the um, new construction meets setbacks And, and that the new construction would meet, meet uh, building codes. Is there a second? Mr. Commissioner Galway, I second it. Thank you. Um, I would like to do a roll call on this. I'm not sure everybody's in agreement. So we'll start on my left. Yay or nay? Yay. 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 No. So the vote is uh, seven, seven to one for deferring. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. I know we discussed earlier sort of around the nine, nine, ten mark. Um, would the commission like to take a break or would you like to keep going? Um, I think we've got one more. Uh, it's up to you. Do you all want to take more. a break or you want to keep going? One more. One more. Okay, let's go. Let's go. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the next project. I got more things here and I know what to do with. <clears throat> the next project is 1Q at 3929 Washington Street, Kensington. And is there a staff report? Uh, yes, there is, Mr. Chair. This is the staff report for hop number 1032177 at 3929 on Washington Street in Kensington. It's uh, constructed circa 1953 with post-1966 addition. It's identified as a secondary resource in the Kensington Historic District which is the equivalent of a non-contributing resource. And the proposal is to demolish the existing building and construct a new single family house on the site. Again, this is to be reviewed under chapter 24A8, the Kensington Master Plan Amendment, including the vision of Kensington, uh, the standards, including, and especially standards two, nine, and 10. So this is the existing subject property. Uh, the addition, the, the post 66 edition is on the left side of the house. Uh, you can see that from the Sanborn map here. So just to take you through, um, 
We've got two trees by the garage. Um, so the Kensington Historic District, again, developed late 19th century. It runs through late Victorian styles, through early revival styles. Um, and there have been uh, six infill houses constructed in the district. Um, you see some of them here. here. And two of the earliest infill houses. So again, this is uh, the Kensington, the town of Kensington in 1904. So uh, what you have on the left is the existing lot configuration with the garage. Uh, and then the proposal before us today, um, the dotted red line here is actually where the um, garage footprint was in um, option one that was presented at the last preliminary consultation. Um, again, the front elevation with an attached front loading garage connected by a breezeway. And there is a small brick wall enclosing sort of a, a motor court. Um, the right side elevation, which is consistent with the previous submission. The rear, uh, it has an exterior staircase to help reduce the size of the uh, detached gara uh, attached garage. And then the left side elevation or west elevation. And again, this is uh, first floor plan. Um, the floor plan of the house is not changed from the preliminary consultation. Uh, again, the um, garage is pushed back as far as it can to comply with zoning. Um, and it's surrounded by a brick walled motor court. Um, these were, I think, only recently uploaded into the board book. So you see a perspective of the house looking from the west, from the center, and then from the right or the east. And then uh, the applicant provided these representative examples of the wall proposed for the motor court. So staff finds the existing ranch house does not contribute to the character of the district or the streetscape and may be demolished as part of a hop um, because Kensington does not direct the HPC to allow demolition of secondary resources. Staff finds a standalone demolition would be detrimental to the character of the streetscape because it would leave a gap in the block settlement pattern uh, even though this is an infill house. Uh, staff finds the proposed house placement, house placement will avoid impacting two mature trees along the right or east property boundary and the applicant submitted an arborist report to that effect. Staff finds the architectural style and decoration of the proposed shingle revival style house is compatible with the district's Victorian era development and specific elements such as the wall dormers help create a design that is distinctly contemporary which satisfies the requirements of standard nine. Staff finds the proposed house mass does not overwhelm the character of the site or surrounding district. And staff finds the proposed materials are compatible for new construction uh, and building additions in the Kensington Historic District. Um, just, just to note that the drawings note a siding or cedar, sh cedar shingles. However, the applicant has settled on new cedar. Um, the examples were distributed during the work session. Um, the drawings also note a brick or stone foundation and the applicant has settled on brick. Um, However, staff finds that the attached front loading garage is incompatible with the character of the surrounding streetscapes and finds the proposal contravenes 24A8B2. Um, staff addition, additionally finds that even under a lenient review, the front loading garage would seriously impair the character of the historic district per 24A8D. Uh, staff has been able to identify two instances of attached front loading garages in the historic district. Both, were, uh, both are identified as secondary resources um, that were constructed before the district were, was established and they were not reviewed by the HPC. And staff additionally finds that the gar attached garage effectively widens the house to 79 feet. Uh, I believe the staff report actually misidentifies that as 81. Um, but 79 feet still makes it the second widest house on the street. So the LAP provided comments, which were also loaded into the board book. The LAP concurred with the staff report, finding the house attractive and appropriately scaled, but also found the front-facing attached garage was incompatible form that negatively impacted the overall streetscape. The HPC also received supportive letters, also uploaded into the board book, from three neighboring property owners. So staff recommends that the HPC deny the hop, uh, that's 103-2177, as inappropriate and inconsistent with the character of the district under 24A8A. 
and I will answer any questions. Any questions for staff? Commissioner Burdett? So the, the reason for the side attached garage is the, tr is, the, is the cherry tree in the back because the staff believes that any front-loading garage adjacent to the house is incompatible so that the only thing they could do is put the garage behind the house or back in the backyard and it, taking out a couple of trees in the process. Is that where the staff is with this or just, are you just not with the garage? Well, uh, the the reason for the front loading attached garage is because that's what the applicant wants. Yeah, no, I, I understand that, but staff is opposed to that. So yes, st staff would recommend taking the trees down and having a detached garage. Okay, just checking. Would be a more appropriate form. Okay, thank. Any other question for staff? Thank you. Uh, now we will hear from the property owner and representative. I have um, Tom and Maggie McCullough and Luke Olson. I see two people. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you, could, if you could identify yourselves and um, uh, uh, turn on the microphone for the record and you'll have seven minutes to do a presentation. Thank you, Commissioner. So my name's Tom McCullough and we, we were just here, I think it's on. May 10th. We were just here about a month ago uh, unfortunately, the commissioner, I can't remember his name, but the one that recommended that we do this kind of, it was a good idea, we thought, and he's not here tonight. He is. Oh, I'm sorry, which one? Commissioner Haynes. Oh, uh, Commissioner Haynes, I'm sorry. I got you mixed up with the... No, no problem. Okay, no so problem. in any event, we, we did a, we, we filed the exact instructions that the majority of the commissioners I think um, concluded the meeting as being uh, something that you thought would work. Um, and we just feel like it's the right design for the house and the right design for the lot. We really don't want to tear the trees down. And it's really the only solution to, to save the trees. So you want to sure. add to that? Yeah, Luke Olson, GTM Architects. Um, I, Agreeing with what Tom said, I feel like we came in at the May 10th hearing and we had a consensus of essentially that an attached garage would be okay if it was properly designed and we're encouraged to push it further back from the, the front wall of the house. And um, there was a proposal to screen it with this garden wall to create this parking court. And we thought that was a great idea. It seemed like three or four commissioners were very interested in that idea. Uh, we reduced the garage width. We reduced the garage depth, we pushed it as far back as we could, but we received pretty clear instruction from the homeowners that they wanted to save that magnolia tree in the rear. And it's not a tree that you can just replace. They, they want to keep it, they care about it. And there's, so- There's also a spruce tree. And there are also, are also the, the twin spruce trees back there. there. So um, within those constraints and um, taking into consideration the arborist letter that said that we can't push it any further to the right and that we needed to hold that line uh, this is as far back as we could push it and still keep it attached. We've worked very hard to break the massing down to make it look like it was potentially a detached garage that was then later attached with the breezeway. I think um, most of the commissioners were very complimentary of that massing in the last meeting. Um, and then, then I'd just like to reiterate that the, the reasoning behind having an attached garage is saving as many of the, the mature trees on the lot as possible, which is also a consideration that historic is supposed to take into account. Um, the, the condition that our clients have asked for, which is accessibility and aging in place considerations. Uh, I believe you have a, a 91 year old mother that you're trying to get to move into the yeah. house with you. Yeah, we're actually, I mean, we, we don't want to push the garage to the back of the yard. Um, you know, we're trying to get my mom, who's 91, to live with us, and she's actually in very good health. <laughs> so it's not like she's incapacitated or anything, but we, we don't want to start out with something that's way in the back of the yard. And then this is a secondary resource, and per standard nine, you're supposed to differentiate it from the historic resources. One of the simplest ways to do this is to have an attached front-loading garage because that's something that's only seen in secondary resources in the historic district, as the staff report points out. And we feel like we've accomplished that in a way that makes it feel appropriate. Um, and then the other one is that it, it 
decreases the total amount of impervious lot coverage and impact a lot in general to locate it here versus pushing it back where we need more driveway, more hardscape, um, more grading, we're removing trees. Uh, this just seemed like the least impactful and most beneficial option for this particular lot. Not saying it applies throughout the historic district, but here specifically, given these requirements, we thought this was an appropriate solution. And just one final comment. You know, there's been some discussion about how it's the second widest proposed house on the street. Well, this is actually the widest lot on Washington Street. It's not the, it's not the largest lot, but it's the widest lot from you know, the street frontage. And I believe, as one commissioner pointed out in the last meeting, the largest house on this street and one of the largest ones in the historic district is directly across the street from this. So the, the massing is something that's there. And I, and I think that's a successful house in the historic district. I, I walk past this maybe every other week and uh, just love the character of that street. We've got a couple other projects there. And uh, we, we really feel like this will fit in well. Anything else? Thank you. Any questions for the owner or the owner's representative? Commissioner Haynes. Um, how, how long is the existing house, the, the length of your footprint relative to the existing house? Is it about the same? Uh, except for the excluding the garage, the the main it's, it's block. It's actually of the house. several feet uh, less in width. Okay. It's maybe six or seven feet less in width okay. than the existing structure. Okay. And it's about on the on the right hand side. It appears the right hand side wall of the house is about the same relationship to the setback and property line. I mean, you're not shifting the house to the right you looks like you're pretty much keeping uh, uh, the distance from the right side setback yeah, but basically the arbor said we couldn't really move the couldn't footprint move. Okay. he, he kind of wanted to stick it right in the same spot okay thank you any other questions commissioner pelletier um thanks did you look ever at a side-loaded garage? Is there enough room to bring the car around no, to the really, side? We, we actually did. There's, there's really no room for that because th there's not enough room for you know, the radius to turn a car into the side. Because you're keeping the existing curb cut, I take it? Well, even if you um, actually move the curb cut, you'd be taking out more trees, as you can see. But then you would... Uh, you would also not have enough turning radius to get in. Yeah, to, to get garage. into the okay. garage. Yeah, that was. I was just curious if you guys had looked at that. Thanks, Mr. Burdett. Um, trees are, um, for as long lived as they are, they are very, very touchy when you get anywhere near their roots during construction, um, and the new construction is, is, close. The paving, would be right there. And you'd be ripping up old paving. Have you talked to an arborist about mm -hmm. how to protect that tree or keep it going when it is being disturbed from its yes. existing condition? Which particular tree? The, the magnolia? Cherry. The cherry tree? The so as a part of the change that we made by taking the stair out of the back of the garage and putting it exterior, that allows us to wood frame that essentially like we would a deck and put it on footers rather than having to dig a full like bench footer or, or some sort of grade beam to support it. And so it's minimizing the impact. We can take those steps and do the same measures and then um, get into um, other protective measures to, in an attempt to save that. It's also interesting because the topo is, is kind of dramatic. And actually, the rear of the house, the basement, there's almost zero excavation because it's a walkout basement. So. And so, and, and you will have a. Um, is there a civil engineer or landscaping firm with this that yes. will develop C plans? Cass engineering. Okay. Yes. During construction to protect that tree? Okay. Yes. If there are no more questions, would anyone like to start deliberations?
Commissioner Radu. I can start. I was in favor last time, and I'm still in favor, despite reading the recommendations or the letter from the LAP. And it, I under, and I went back and like went to Vision Kensington, look again through the plan and what's what are character defining features and everything. And if this was a historic building, I would not agree with an attached garage, but it's not. So that being said. I, I think it is a successful um, design. I think it sets back as much as you can be, as much as it can be set back for this lot. And it preserves the greenery at the back and the trees and everything. So I'm actually in favor. Commissioner Haynes. Um. I too, and, and, and I, I think that going back to the vision of Kensington, and and I, I believe staff um, alluded to this in their discussion of how the uh, homes in this part of Kensington, the landscape sort of wraps around the house, and accessory structures are uh, uh, secondary and and push back. So there's certainly detached garages with front facing garage doors. Um, but I think in spirit with the this garden wall and uh, auto court um, that the spirit of the garden wrapping or the notion that the examples that you provided uh, of garden walls I think helps uh, give you the sense of how this could feel, that, that the garden could still wrap around, even though it's an auto court. I, I do think, the, great, these examples here are, I think, uh, would meet the spirit of Kensington, uh, vision of Kensington, of the garden coming and wrapping the house. Um, uh, so, I, so I think you, this is pretty good. The only, there is one scheme that I do think could be possible uh, and still be connected, but you, you could push the garage back and have the connection on the back face of the house to the mudroom, an enclosed connection. So it would push the garage back uh, along the, the, the setback line and further get it back. But I'm, I'm not opposed to what you have here um, because I think the garden wall, the auto court can, with proper landscaping, and you, it looks like you've, you've you made provisions to put landscaping on the edges by the front of the house and by the garage door that, and, and appropriate landscaping around the garden <coughs> wall uh, would meet that spirit of the vision of Kensington, although I wouldn't mind you testing pushing the garage back and having a connector to the, where you have the powder room, maybe push your mud room back there so you enter into the mud room and pull your powder room forward um, would be another way to maybe to get that massing further back. But I'm sort of telling you two different things. I, I, I generally would support this as, as designed because of the garden wall and the potential for the landscaping. What else? Um, Commissioner Burdett? I'm, I'm in support of this. I appreciate the staff's uh, argument and point of view. Um, but this, this is a, going to be a charming house. It's replacing a rather dowdy looking mid century. Rambler, um, and the guard, the the auto court, I think, is a nice uh, way to address um, the need for garage and its location, and might serve as an inspiration to other people in Kensington that they too could make their front-loading garage look nicer if they wanted to. So I am supportive of this, and good luck with the tree. Anyone else? Uh, is there a motion? Uh, 
Um, <coughs> I move that the uh, HPC approve hop number 1032177 at 3929 Washington Street, Kensington, uh, based on Chapter 24A8. Uh, um, 8B2, work is compatible in character uh, with the neighborhood in this case. Um, uh, and that uh, uh, 24A, 8B6, the general welfare of the neighborhood, in my opinion, is better supported by granting this proposal. Secretary, do you want any secretary standards? Uh, secretary standards. Um, Number nine, uh, no, uh, number nine additions, in this case, new construction uh, does not destroy the historic character of the neighborhood. Um, and that um, um, I, I think it does differentiate, differentiate itself from, from the historic fabric of the neighborhood. Is there a second? Is this Commissioner Pelletier, I'll second. Thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Thank you very much. Project's approved. Thank you. Okay, we've got one thing that I accidentally skipped, which I apologize for, which is project number 1B, um, which is um, at 21 Columbia Avenue in Tacoma Park. Mr. Chair, hearing no objections, I move that we approve the following historic area work permit in accordance with the staff reports based on the record before us <clears throat> in consideration of the recommendations of local advisory panels and including any conditions recommended by staff. Hop number 1025766 six at 21 Columbia Avenue, Tacoma Park. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Rado, I second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. This project's approved as well. Uh, minutes. Do we have minutes for May 24? Yes, Chair Sutton, the minutes for the May 24th meeting were included in your packet. Yes, and I read them. <laughs> and I think they're correct, <laughs> as I recall. So I make a motion that we approve the minutes from May 24. No one's going to second it? Commissioner, no second, I'll them? second. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay, I apologize in advance for this um, for a commission um, meeting, but I think this is important. Um, and this has to do with two properties that we that we nominated to be included uh, in master, as master plan sites in the county. Um, these are the Edward Taylor School and the Wellers Dry Cleaning. So as a little background on, um, I have it here in a minute. On February 23rd, 2023, there was a hearing before the uh, planning board, and in that in that meeting, the planning board found uh, by three to two, uh, not in favor of including Weller's dry cleaning. They unanimously um, felt that we should include the Edward Taylor School. Um, if anyone watched the the um, planning board hearing. It was very clear to me, at least, that the two people who approved uh, Weller's dry cleaning um, approved it based on the criteria that we are supposed to pay attention to and they are supposed to pay attention to. The three who voted against it had no criteria whatsoever, as far as I could tell, except they felt sorry for the owners. And they did not follow the criteria. I don't know if anyone else agreed, saw it, and agreed with that or not. So from there, it went to county council, and on, um, I've got the date here, excuse me for a second. On 
Uh, April 25th, I believe, there's a public hearing before the County Council and our wonderful commissioner, Ms. Nasser, <laughs> represented us, gave a fantastic testimony. If I were there, I would have voted immediately to approve it. <laughs> uh, most, of the, most of the testimony was in favor of um, approving both properties. There were a couple who were opposed to uh, including Wellers and um, the uh, owners, of course, were opposed to it, but, but I would say it was, I think it was eight or nine to three in favor, including um, several who were experts in both in uh, Art Deco and in Googie architecture. So we, had, we were well represented. From there, this last Monday, uh, which would be June, um, June 12th, uh, we went before the uh, subcommittee of the county council, um, which uh, the purpose was to list to, uh, to take this further, to, to consider this, uh, to present to the entire council. I got to say it was one of the most disappointing meetings I have ever been to in my entire life. Um, the, the county staff presented the, uh, to the, uh, the, the, the county council that the, um, the subcommittee, the subcommittee, yeah, the sub, sub, I'm sorry, to the subcommittee, that um, the, the planning board uh, said that Wellers did not meet the designation criteria for listing, and that is absolutely incorrect. They did not even pay attention to that, so I was very upset by that. Um, they also recommended that the council deny including Wellers um, as, a, as a site. And one of the things in, in, the, uh, in this report from the county staff said that the, uh, the, the, the board, the council, is not bound by recommendations of the planning board, nor is it limited to review of criteria provided in Chapter 24A. And then it says in Chapter 24A, it includes this purpose to, and quote, to preserve and enhance the quality of life in the county, safeguard historical and cultural heritage of the county, strengthen the local economy, stabilize and improve property values in and around such historic areas, foster civic beauty, and preserve continued utilization and pleasure of the citizens of the county. I don't see anywhere in there what says that they should, they should turn it down because the property owners are opposed to it. And so um, I was, I think both of us, um, Commissioner, you might want to add to it, but Commissioner Nasser and I, I think we're very, very upset by the, by, the, it was a unanimous, they didn't even ask us to come forward to testify. Um, um, Rebecca and John were there. They did a wonderful job, but there wasn't much they could do either. They just did their presentation, asked no questions of anybody and uh, unanimously um, voted to, to not approve, including Wellers. And I think what's so upsetting about this is that, you know, I feel as a volunteer that I am giving my time um, to try to do good things for the county. And one of those things is to preserve really important historic sites. And I don't feel like, like the county planning board or commission, county, uh, the county board or the planning board are supporting us right now, and that's very disturbing to me. You want to add anything to that? Um, <laughs> this is Commissioner Nasser. Yeah, I'm relatively new to this, but I was also very disappointed because to me it was a no-brainer. Um, the reason, I mean, the reasoning, the logic, no, nothing logical behind the denial of this um, application. And uh, um, yeah, as you said, I, I'm just, if we just, we all felt emotional when they bring cases in front of us, what would happen? Like imagine if we just go based on emotion and oh, I like this owner, I, I don't like this owner. Is there any politics behind some of these reasons? So I, I thought we are supposed to follow the criteria. We are supposed to find, um, you know, like a balance. But um, yeah, unfortunately it was very short. I actually had to Uber there because I had very bad, bad back pain and I couldn't drive and they didn't ask us any question, any, anything. So it was very short and, <laughs> you know, painful. I honestly believe if the Taj Mahal were presented to the county board, 
and the owners were opposed to it, they'd say, nope, sorry. Um, and one, you know, one project that was approved before my time was the Josiah Henson House, which is Uncle Tom's Cabin, and the owners were opposed to that. Now, can you all imagine what would have happened had the uh, county not approved it and the owners tore it down? I mean, it's one of the most important historic sites in the county, and the owners were opposed to it. So anyway, I, I was very discouraged. I don't know. I just wanted to let you all know um, what, what we tried to do and did not succeed, uh, which is to, to list this really, I think, very important property in the, in the master. Do you want to add anything? I, am I going on too much here? <laughs> No, I don't have anything to add except next steps. So the council will advertise, the, the full council will deliberate on it. And at that meeting, the PHP committee will present out their recommendation to the full council on the master plan. And then they'll schedule the adoption of the plan shortly thereafter. The indication from staff is that this will actually happen before the August recess. So I'll let you know when there's a date for that. Um, at the full council, staff typically, planning board staff typically does not present at all. Um, but we will be there in attendance. Yes. Yeah. So one, one last thing before it get hopefully it comes out before it goes to the full council again, is Preservation Magazine is going to be listing Wellers in their transition section as a threatened property Good. worthy of designation or worthy of saving. So if, if nothing else, we'll get national attention through Preservation Magazine that the county doesn't take preservation as seriously as it ought to. Yeah. Thank you. And that's all I have for any other commission business before we move on. Staff business. There is a staff item. So June is Pride Month, celebrating LGBTQ heritage across the nation. And we have many celebratory <coughs> events here in Maryland and many events here planned at the commission in Montgomery County and in Prince George's County. Um, this past weekend, MNC PPC had a booth at Capital Pride downtown where we were really pleased. I'll put it up there. So this is, this is our book that Preservation Maryland published with our office and with the city of Baltimore and the Maryland Historical Trust on the statewide LGBTQ context study. It's called Planting the Rainbow Flag and features, here I'll pass it down, and we have, cop I can bring copies to the next meeting. And it features LGBTQ heritage sites across the state our office has been actively involved in this effort at the national, state, and local level for many years. I've personally been involved with this for about nine years now. Um, this past February, we presented out to the Maryland Historical Trust, to the GCC, the National Register nomination for the Robert Coggin House. I know that had come to you all. Um, unfortunately, the day before the hearing, the owner objected to that at the state. So unless we can change their minds, it won't actually be listed to the National Register, but the state, the GCC did find that it met, that the Robert Coggin House met criteria for National Register listing, including Criterion G. So we're, we're working on edits and cleanup, and the nomination will be sent forward to the Park Service for them to have in their files, though it is not able to actually be listed in the National Register because of the owner's objections. That notwithstanding, the book itself is a really tremendous you know, piece, piece of work. There was a lot of interest in it at Capital Pride. People coming from you know, all over the state, all over the region come to Capital Pride and we're saying things like, you know, I, we didn't have anything like this out on the Eastern Shore. We don't have anything like this where I'm from. And they're very excited to receive the book. I've been speaking with folks who do the curriculum at Montgomery County Public Schools to get this book accepted into the school system for the teachers to use as part of their curriculum. And I'll be presenting out the booklet to the Joint, Mar um, the joint Montgomery County and Prince George's County um, Commission at their hearing next Wednesday. We'll be giving copies to our council members and to other, other folks who are interested as well. So we're really proud of, of this effort and I'm really pleased to share it with you. Thank Very you. Nice. Thank you so much.
Yes. It's great. If there's nothing else, the meeting is adjourned. Didn't make it to midnight.